Thank you, Eugene. Uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world with us today. Um, thank you for joining us on this webinar. There are a lot of slides to get through today, so I apologize at the brevity in some of the slides, but as Eugene stated, we will be delivering both the recording and PDF copies of all of this information and the academic references to you um, as part of participating on this webinar. So again, thank you. <clears throat> so today what I wanted to cover was a brief overview and common language of pharmacoepidemiology and some of the different observational study types that are utilized in signal uh, confirmation and signal, sometimes signal detection as well. I also wanted to focus specifically on two very interesting free online databases and tools that you could use in your pharmacoepidemiologic endeavors. And then I will also cover very quickly the traditional fee-based databases that are used in these types of observational trials. So first, if we just look at some of the common language, uh, just a few small acronyms, ADR, adverse drug reaction. I also added on here a PR for adverse product reaction. We do a lot of work with medical device firms, and the construct of ADR is not appropriate always for a device firm. So I've changed that to an acronym of APR for common discourse. Also, the CION working group, these, will be, uh, th these are the various uh, meeting teams that are the Council for International Organizations of Medical Sciences who routinely meet and cover very uh, important pharmacovigilance and drug safety strategies for uh, the work that we do in pharmacoepidemiology. And these slides are very loosely based on the CION 8 working group. Specifically. And then, of course, we have the EMA, the European Medicines Agency. We also need to come to a common uh, understanding of what we mean by the term signal for these slides. And I took this from the CIOM Date Working Group publication. Uh, if, if you have not received a copy of that or, or reviewed it, I highly recommend it. It is a really good, uh, very comprehensive read when it comes to signal management and both traditional and non-traditional means of accomplishing your company's goal of doing signal detection and the other parts of the signal management life cycle, signal prioritization and evaluation. So these slides, we want to see a signal as information that may arise from one or many other sources that suggests some type of new causal association or a new aspect of a known association. So for example, an increase in intensity of a particular uh, association or maybe even a decrease in intensity of a known association. <clears throat> Signal detection itself is the, just simply the act of looking for these various signals. And the CIOMS 8 Working Group publication is very clear that while the use of comprehensive databases and large public database sets are really interesting and cutting edge right now, that the traditional individual case safety reports and the periodic report assessments that occur from those individual case safety reports really should not be overshadowed by these interesting automated signal detection methods, such as Empirica Signal. The traditional approach to signal detection is just as important as the automated signal detection methods that you may be familiar with. I took a definition from a uh, British researcher, Waller, who published a, a text that is also in this the slide deck in the reference section, a very easy read, a very comprehensive uh, introduction to pharmacoepidemiology. Again, I highly recommend it. In, in his text, 
Waller described signal prioritization as really a controversial method of ensuring only those signals that are deemed worthy of internal resources are packed into the formal, more complex, complex and comprehensive evaluation process. And I should mention here that internal resources does not just indicate a monetary uh, concern. There are many other factors that go into the prioritization of a signal. On this screen, I or slide, I have given you three examples of, well, two practical examples, one from the WHO, who use an ER-based triage process in their prioritization process, and again, for the same reason, to ensure that they use appropriate resources for appropriate signals, or potential signals, we should say at this point. And then the MHRA uh, uses a different analytical method, um, and it's used as it comprised itself of mathematical scores that will calculate themselves and then contribute to an overall score for the signal. And that score is what drives whether or not to move that signal into the next phase of signal management, which is, in fact, signal evaluation. There are, however, other articles in the literature, and I have given you a few references in the last part of this presentation that have very interesting and very uh, slick ways of prioritizing various signals that may occur. Um, notably, an article from Johnson & Johnson where they have a very uh, comprehensive method of formally prioritizing and then evaluating each of the signals that they detect, either through manual investigation, through individual case safety reports, or periodic PSUR reporting, or through automated signal detection, such as Empirica signal. Finally, signal evaluation. This is the formal process of reviewing scientific data sources to either refute or confirm the existence of the signal within your company product uh, safety profile. And this is what will feed the signal into the risk management process at your company. So this should be a very multifaceted approach according to the Sion Bate Working Group. You may choose to collect evidence to evaluate this causal link that you've identified or potential causal link. You may utilize these public databases to gather background rates to see if the potential signal that you are looking at is warrants further investigation. There's many ways to accomplish this signal evaluation uh, component of signal management. <clears throat> and while I have alluded to it, I thought I would show you the actual CIOM date working group signal uh, detailed signal management life cycle. I have tried to simplify it by categorizing in the arrow, large arrow boxes those activities from the Sion Date Working Group that are related to one another in my modified simple form of signal management, which really just comprises itself of three cyclic properties, signal detection, followed by signal prioritization, followed by signal evaluation. So as you can see, there's actually a lot of detail within each of those simplified steps within signal management. And all of that is clearly outlined by the Sion Date Working Group in a very uh, easy to understand manner. For today's discussion, we're really focusing here on the signal evaluation step within the signal management life cycle. It is within this step that we may choose to use pharmacoepidemiologic study design to, again, confirm or refute various signals that may have been identified. In this small table that I'm showing you right now is in order of difficulty of execution and increasing 
your strength of causal evidence from the bottom to the top are the various types of study design. Some are observational and some are experimental. As you can see, we go all the way down to case report, which would be the far easiest of the study designs to execute, but it has the least amount of causal inference capability. And as you traverse upward in this table, you will gather your strength in causal evidence, but you will also increase the order of difficulty in executing these types of study design. The experimental study design that we have here is at the top, and that would be your randomized, typically your randomized control trials. So potentially you could also have experimental designs that are not controlled. Just a small side note, uh, as you can see in the, ta the previous table, there was a discussion of case control studies as well as cohort studies. And there sometimes is some misunderstanding on the differences between these two types of epidemiologic study design. So this slide I thought would be very helpful in, at least it helped me, let's say, in understanding the differences between the case control and the cohort study design. And really, the, the root of this discussion is what do we know and what do we want to know? So for example, if I know a group of individuals have a particular disease of interest, but I'm curious to know about the exposure of our medicinal product, and its relationship to that disease, then I probably need a case control study design. This is different, a different research question in the prospective or retrospective cohort study design, where we know certain groups of people's exposure to our product, but we're unaware of the disease of interest, which have it, which do not. So this is really the key difference between a case control and a prospective or retrospective cohort design. There are many reasons for pharmacoepidemiologic studies. Um, there are regulatory reasons for doing this. Um, they, many now are required for approval, especially in identified risk management processes. You may have it, uh, several pharmacoepidemiologic studies as a response to a particular audit. They can also be a very powerful tool in marketing. They can assist in market penetration by further documenting a safety profile. For example, comparing your product to other products on the market, either like-minded or, or uh, different chemical entities. It can also be used as a name recognition uh, increaser. So for example, you conduct these, these research efforts, you publish the articles, you uh, increase the brand recognition of your product. There are many examples of repositioning the drug based on these pharmacoepidemiologic studies in the literature. This can have a, a wide effect. You may find age, gender, ethnic or genetic differences in particular patient populations. This can then aid in the targeting of the drug to particular participants. You may have different um, outcome measures. So for example, quality of life uh, aspects that you would like to see in the marketplace. Does our product increase quality of life. And then there is always the, the wonderful opportunity, hopefully, of the medicinal product or the, the product in nature of creating an unintended benefit of the product, which could then lead to future indications or multiple indications of use. Unfortunately, in our world, uh, we also are faced with legal reasons that we need to do these pharmacoepidemiologic studies. This could be either in anticipation of or in response to particular pending legal action. 
You also may have clinical reasons that you want to perform these pharmacoepidemiologic studies. You may be trying to generate new hypotheses to increase particular knowledge of a particular part of your safety profile. Um, this is especially useful when your product is a new entity in the marketplace. And you may actually want to do some hypothesis testing, looking at particular benefits of the product and its effects, as well as maybe even harmful ones. Again, this is where we would look toward the pharmacoepidemiologic observational study designs to actually test particular hypotheses. And all of these examples are clearly noted in a very uh, comprehensive textbook by Strong, Strom and Kemmel. Uh, it also is an excellent text to have. I've given you the reference in this slide deck as well. That is a much, much larger textbook that's a formal academic textbook. And it's a little uh, harder to get through, but it is far more comprehensive than Waller. All right, so I do, again, apologize, but we are limited with time. So that was a very quick overview of pharmacoepidemiology and some of the study designs that we utilize. And then now I want to use all of that to give context to the next two sections of the slide deck. The first, we are going to look at two very exciting free online databases where you can perform a number of these types of activities for confirming or refuting your signals that you may have detected and formally moved into evaluation. <clears throat> So again, there are two broad kinds of databases that we use in this type of work. There are four free databases, and then there are four fee databases. And I would say that uh, the four fee databases are far more uh, known, utilized, and uh, published on than the four free databases. But these four free databases, at least the two that I will demonstrate to you, could potentially give you access to some information where you did not have to pay large fees in order to gain uh, the data in order to accomplish these pharmacoepidemiologic trials. So the two that I'm going to focus on that are the four free databases are the CDC Wonder database and a brand new uh, database called the EU ADR. So the CDC Wonder is obviously very US focused. All of the information comes from patients found in the United States. The EU ADR is very EU focused, and the patient data that is found in that database is obviously uh, European Union based. So all of the biases associated with the data collection between US-based patient populations and EU-based patient populations that holds for those two databases. So please make sure you're aware of that before you start to draw inferences uh, from the information that you query. So the CDC Wonder database is the wide-ranging online database for epidemiologic research. It is a very easy to use internet-based web tool uh, provided to us by the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. <clears throat> it's actually available not only to public health professionals at large, but even the public. And it has a huge amount of information from multiple data sets governed by and reported from the CDC. Once you attach yourself to that website, you will see a number of public databases that you'll be able to query on. <clears throat> One of the major limitations with the CDC Wonder is we are limited to only mandatory reported events. So this would be death events, um, cancers, HIV AIDS, STIs, a lot of information on sexually transmitted infections or STIs. So if your medicinal product 
have any of those therapeutic uses, the CDC Wonder databases will provide you a very nice interface to gather the information about prevalence and incidence rates in the U.S. population for your various diseases of interest. If, however, your product of interest is outside of those areas of indication, you may not find the CDC Wonder website useful. I'm going to, for the next few slides, assume that not 100% of the subpopulation afflicted with a disease, say, dies from that disease. Um, and this means we may be able to use the mortality rate as a, con a confirmation or a refutation of a suspected ADR. So for example, we are going to use the CDC Wonders mortality database to look at causes of death that may have some type of relationship to a disease of interest that we have found in our safety signals, either using our safety individual case safety reporting system, such as Argus Safety, or using a signal detection system like Empirica Signal. So to do this, I access the mortality database. And when I come in here, I am able to associate and look at the information in various ways. So here, for example, I can group my results by age group, if that is appropriate to me. I can print out optional measures. I can look at a crude rate standard error. I can look at a percentage, a raw percentage of total, or even a crude rate confidence interval. One of the differences you'll see with the CDC Wonder database is much like the rest of the Department of Health and Human Services, the, the information is coded to the IC, ICD dictionary and not to MEDRA. I can also focus my query of the mortality data to particular states if I wanted to, or I can choose the entire United States. I can then again pick particular age groups, genders, race, uh, ethnicity as defined by the U.S. government, or urbanization. Um, how close are they to a metropolitan area or not. I can then look at particular years and months that are captured in the mortality database. And all of this, what do you choose, what shouldn't you choose, this all would be decided up front in standard research question development, right? So I know what to select here in my query because I have spent time with my biostatisticians and my medical directors working out the hypotheses of the type of query I need to get the answers to. You also have the autopsy information if that is appropriate, again, to your research question. So many, many options here in the, just in the mortality database alone. <clears throat> Once you've added all of the parameters around your query, the next step would be to select one or more of your causes of death. And again, these have to be encoded, all of the deaths that have been reported to CDC have been re reported back and coded into ICD-10 codes specifically. So now I would focus on the particular malignancy that is appropriate for my research hypothesis or question that I'm asking, which in this case I'm looking at what is the underlying incidence rate in the American population for a particular type of malignancy. In this case, I'm looking at neoplasms of the stomach. I can then select my calculated rate. So how do I want this data displayed? Um, per 100,000 is the typical way that mortality rates would be uh, displayed. So that is what I've selected here. And you have various other options in the, in the other options section. 
Once I have all of my attributes done, then I can click the Send button, and I will receive essentially a, a table listing out <coughs> my crude mortality rate for per 100,000 individuals in the resulting table. And now I have a comparative measure to my rate that I'm seeing in my signal that I have detected either using uh, advanced signal detection algorithms like, like Empirica Signal or in my traditional uh, methods of individual case safety or periodic reporting analysis. So again, we did make a number of assumptions to get to this point. Uh, I find, at least for this example, I believe that the assumptions are valid. You would have to, again, work with your biostatistician, your, your medical directors, and uh, if you are lucky enough to be part of a firm that has a department of epidemiology, your, your epidemiologists on staff, to make sure that all of the assumptions, hypotheses, and information that you are gathering is appropriate to the research questions you're being asked. So again, this is just an example of one database within the CDC Wonder system. There are many, many other database sets within the CDC Wonder system that may be advantage, may pose an advantage to your organization. So even if the mortality rate is not a good example for your company, I strongly advise you to go out to the CDC Wonder website and look to see if there's any other database that may be helpful in estimating prevalence or incidence rates within a particular population for your company. <clears throat> okay. The next your free database that I would like to look at is this really amazing online database that I stumbled across last year. And it's called the EU ADR Project. It's extremely innovative. It is using computerized systems to detect adverse drug reactions that will, in turn, supplement our spontaneous reporting systems, such as Argus Safety or even Empirica Safety. Uh, uh, sorry, Empirica Signal. So once it, this is a relatively new database project, so certain pieces are still being worked on. But once it is complete, it will have electronic health records, not just electronic patient records from individual case safety reports, but actual electronic health records from over 30 million patients from several EU countries. This uses a very interesting and complex method of text mining and other epidemiologic uh, and computational techniques to analyze all of those various health records to detect signals and then rank those signals back to you in a very easy to read manner. This does require you to register for access to this website, but it does not cost. Once you are registered, you can log in to the EU ADR website, <coughs> excuse me, and you'll be, <coughs> you'll be prompted with two main tabs, a data set tab and a workflow tab. The data set tab is where we go to create particular drug and event pairs that we are interested in. And these contain all marketed drugs uh, listed in the to who drug dictionary, and all of those drugs are coded all the way down to the ATC level five. Um, this is a an uncommon level to code our who drug verbatim terms all the way down to level five, but level five actually is the medicinal product record for a particular drug within the who drug dictionary. So on this screenshot. You can see these J numbers uh, in front of everything, J04AM02. That represents in the Who Drug Dictionary a very specific drug. Maybe a combination medication, it may be an individual medication, but it represents a single chemical entity construct. 
Then you have the ability to select a particular disease of interest or event. <coughs> and the events here are coded in this particular screen to specific abbreviations that are specific to the EU ADR web-based system. <coughs> so again, not ICD-9, not ICD-10, not MEDRA. They, it's a proprietary um, event code specific to this particular system. But once you've created this drug and event combination, you now can pass that drug event pair into the various engines of this comprehensive searching database. The first database that you can put the event drug pair into is a review of all of the Medline uh, literatures that are available. And here on the screen I've given you the algorithm that is utilized when it is querying all of the publication data to decide whether or not to return to you a signal score. So certain things have to be met in the literature in order for this particular database to return to you an indication that this event drug pair is in fact a signal. There's also a Medline co-occurrence engine that you can run this event and product pair into. You can look at a daily med search engine as well, which is a separate publication uh, engine. All of these work in the same way. They take your drug and event pair, they search the available literature, and if certain things are met in the logic of the algorithm, then it returns to you a potential indication of a potential signal. <coughs> the drug bank database is a separate database maintained by a, a separate university in the Netherlands. Um, and again, works in the exact same way. It passes the drug and event pair into that database, looks up all of the available data with respect to that drug event pair, and if particular thresholds are met, it will return an indication of a signal. The, the substantiation engine is fascinating um, in my perspective. It takes genetic information, again, uh, maintained by a particular organization in, in, in Spain, and it passes that drug event pair into that engine, and it looks for uh, genotypes that are actually related to exposed phenotypes of your event to see if, in fact, there is a plausible biologic or genetic uh, relationship between your event and your product pair. This is a, a really exciting and very, very interesting area for uh, signal detection and can really aid in not just confirming a signal, but can also introduce to you particular pieces of literature that may be used in your confirmation or refuting of a particular signal. Again, when you pass each of these drug and event pairs into the separate databases we just described within the EU ADR web-based system, you will either find results or you will have these warning messages that tell you that there were, in fact, no retrieved relationships. There are some definite limitations in this database. Um, first of all, it is only from a select number of EU countries, so uh, generalizability is not a possibility with that. Um, the system doesn't really provide a fantastic way uh, of, of coding your event terms. This is a very specific way of doing that, so you, you really have to become familiar with the three-letter um, event representation, um, but it does have this incredible uh, ability to substantiate based on biologic plausibility within uh, 
human genomics. Okay, so again, apologies for the brevity. Um, I hope, again, this is just an overview of these databases. Once you get the slides and the references, I really strongly advise you to go out there, <coughs> play around with it. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me um, about them. I will, I will try and answer your questions as, as you have them. So now let's look at the traditional, the more traditional for C-based databases, <coughs> which are arguably far more uh, substantial in their data. They are uh, arguably better organized, better equipped to handle these pharmacoepidemiologic type trials. So I'm just going to cover three, and again, I'm going to cover them very quickly. These are three of the largest that you may have already seen or heard of. The Group Health Cooperative, Kaiser Permanente's uh, Medical Care Program, and the UK Clinical Practice Research Data Link, which you may all be more familiar with as the GPRD database. It has now been rebranded. So let's first look at Group Health. The Group Health Cooperative is uh, a nonprofit healthcare system that is a, essentially a large uh, HMO. And as a large HMO, they have access to electronic medical and healthcare records for particular uh, patients, subjects. In fact, it's about 600,000 people in Washington and Idaho and has a number of automated and manual databases, and those data sets can serve many different types of epidemiologic studies. And this is a fairly stable uh, set of patients and populations over time. So that goes to adding to the credibility of the information that you gather from such a data set. Um, I give in each of the summaries of these four fee base, I give a description of the database um, some of its limitations, and then an example of the use of that database. And these are all taken directly from uh, the Strom and Kimmel, with the exception of the GPRD, which I have uh, rebranded to the CPRD, which is its current nomenclature. Um, so here, for example, I give an example of the retrospective cohort study that was published from the GCH cooperative databases uh, that looked at perinatal outcomes and congenital malformations and early growth and development of infants um, with and infants without prenatal exposure to antidepressants. So this is very much uh, what we were talking about before, a retrospective cohort study um, where once analyzed, we saw, or the, the, the scientists of this article saw, that um, discharge, by looking at the discharge data, the pharmacy data, all of the exposure data that was present in the large comprehensive GCH databases, um, we were a, they were able, rather, to match infants exposed and not exposed to the particular antidepressants of interest and they blinded the medical reviewers itself. So the results of this indicated that uh, tricyclic exposures did not have an association to any of the outcomes of interest, which were uh, premature birth and lower delivery weight. <clears throat> so these types of databases, again, can be used to perform these types of cohort studies right within the, the data sets themselves without recruiting patients or subjects and following those subjects up over time, such as Citanel uh, safety servant surveillance studies that maybe we're more familiar with, which as some of you can attest are quite expensive to do and uh, take time. So the access to these four fee databases can really substantiate your signal detection methods 
and may, even though they cost money as well, may provide a more cost-effective manner than, again, creating large prospective cohort study designs like uh, Sentinel-5. There are some limitations to the GCH database itself. Um, the size of the database really uh, wouldn't allow you to indicate rare or identify rare drug AE combinations. Um, just because it's, it's a smaller, uh, even though it's a large repository, it's still, in terms of size, a little bit smaller than some of the others. So let's look now at the Kaiser Permanente uh, care program. <coughs> this is definitely one of the largest U.S.-based nonprofit HMOs. Um, it has over 8.2 million individuals and covers eight states. Uh, this is an enormous uh, for-fee database, and this can definitely empower researchers to do some really large-scale observational trials. One such example was a retrospective cohort uh, study of patients expo exposed to Resilin in an attempt to understand uh, identified hepatic failure uh, issues that came up with that drug back in the 90s. Um, this cohort was 9,600 diabetic patients who were exposed to the Resolin product over three years. Um, the researchers looked at the hospital discharge summaries and procedure documentation that indicated any type of hepatic injury, and they identified approximately 1,200 individual records after the review, and 109 of these were sent to a blinded panel of pathologists and outcome, uh, for, for outcome adjudication, rather. The blinded panel actually only identified 35 cases where hepatic in injury was uh, attributed to the use of the diabetic medication. Um, however, the entire diabetic population did have an increase of hepatic injury compared to a general population of patients. So again, this is information we would not have been able to identify without access to these large data sets where we could, for example, compare outcome rates of hepatic injury to one group compared to another. So even though if you looked at, for example, the FDA AIRS database using Empirica Signal, if you queried the Resolin product in that particular database, you would see that it has a disproportionality score that indicates a 20 to 25 times higher experience of hepatic failure in Resolin subjects versus any other product and subject in that database. Um, this particular observational study disputes that finding and really suggests that the hepatic failure in, in the Resolin users is far, far smaller. Um, however, we, we should put that into uh, context. We could now look at the CDC Wonder database in that very same mortality rate for hepatic failures not elsewhere classified, and we see a very, even a much smaller um, scale of particular hepatic issues within the, the CDC Wonder mortality database. So again, these observational trials can be very powerful in helping you refute or confirm identified signals that may come out of these large uh, signal detection databases, such as Empirica Signal. Again, due to time, I'm not going to go over some of the limitations here, um, but there, there are a number, and all of those are very important when you are analyzing and reporting back on the analyses. So you do need to make sure that you understand those limitations of the data mark that you're using. <clears throat> all right, so now let's just focus on the UK Clinical Practice Research Data Link, um, also known as the General Practice Research Database of the GPRD. Um, this has data sets comprised of both administrative records and patient care records. 
Um, the administrative records uh, are often used in the billing cycles, and they may not have accurate diagnosis data. Um, it depends on the research question that you're asking as to whether or not you should include the administrative records in your analysis or not. But they, um, they do have some information in there that could be useful depending on your research question that you're formulating. And then secondly, there is uh, patient care data. Um, and these are, these are all of the individual medical records used in the allopathic care of the individual patient. All of their collection and storage, again, may not be appropriate for your research question in an observational study design, but you really need to work with your epidemiologist, epidemiologist and biostat uh, personnel to flush all of that out ahead of time. In the UK, the CPRD is really considered to be one of the world's largest medical records database in use. Um, this was many years ago called the Value Added <coughs> Medical Products Research Data Bank um, in 1987 and has been adding approximately 3 million patients per year into the database every, uh, ever since. Um, and almost a million of these patients have more than, one, uh, more than 11 years worth of observational data over time. This is a, a huge advantage in um, giving us the ability to perform some very interesting observational study uh, models. One example is a retrospective cohort study that looked at acne patients from 1987 to 2002 who, who had been exposed to antibiotics and those who had not. The outcome measures uh, that were looked at were any upper respiratory infections over a 12-month period. And all of the results were adjusted for age, sex, year of diagnosis, number of prescriptions for acne, office visits, history of diabetes, and asthma. Um, all of these things were considered to be potential confounders for the outcome of measure, which again was resp upper respiratory infection. <clears throat> the results of this study indicated that the acne patients exposed to chronic antibiotic treatments did in fact have and demonstrate an increased risk of upper respiratory infection, almost 2.15 times that of anyone not exposed to uh, chronic antibiotic treatment. And this did not change once the confounders were added in. Unfortunately, the etiology uh, or the origin of the upper respiratory infection was not evaluated, i.e., whether it was bacterial or viral. And we also don't know uh, if acne patients in general are more prone to upper respiratory infections independent of antibiotic use. But nonetheless, these are, uh, it is a very interesting study design and something capable within these large observational data sets. And lastly, again, there are limitations within the CPRD database itself. And again, like all of the other databases, you need to be very aware and cognizant of those limitations in your interpretations of the results and any type of extrapolation to your population or to a general population, a, a more generalized population than you are working with. Again, very sorry about the brevity, but I wanted to leave time for questions. Here are the references. You will get all of these in the PDF version. And uh, again, you have the recorded webinar to refer to as well. Um, I think now what we can do is open the webinar up for particular questions. Great. Thank you, Rodney. So before we move on to the Q&A session, I just want to remind everyone that you guys can ask questions via the chat feature. Try to be as clear as possible, and uh, we'll get to as many questions as time allows. Uh, Rodney, I think it may make sense for you to take a look at the, the questions tab. Uh, there are several questions that came in, and due to the many acronyms there are, it might make sense for you just to go ahead and field those exact questions in case I put yeah. them completely. Yeah, no problem. So I'm just going to start from the top and read the questions out. 
So the first uh, is where do the population numbers come from? So I'm, I'm not sure which of the databases this question is in regards to, but in general uh, that information is usually found on the limitation slides in my slide deck. But for example, the CDC wonder data are from uh, mortality events in the mortality database that are deemed mandatory reportable events to the CDC. Um, those come from all death certificates, et cetera, um, in, in various uh, county and state coroner offices. Um, the STI data that comes in comes, again, as reportable sexually transmitted infections like syphilis, gonorrhea, chlamydia, et cetera, HIV. Those are all uh, mandatory, mandatory reports from an individual physician or to a county health uh, department official. So it really just depends on the database as to where the data is coming from. And there was a clarification. That question was in regards to the CDC wonder. So. Okay. Great. So, so there, I, I, I hope that answered it. <clears throat> okay. Uh, the next question is, will the EU ADR include medical device AE pairing? Yes, this is a very interesting question. I have not reached out to them yet, but I plan to, to ask them to make sure that they do include that. It may not be on their horizon right now because, again, their focus right now is on the WHO drug dictionary. And as I assume the person that asked this already knows, medical devices are not encompassed in the WHO drug dictionary. So it's, um, it's a limitation right now in the software. But hopefully in the future we will have something similar. Um, but once I reach out to them, I will keep your name and send you an email and let you know what I find. Okay, um, the next question is, if the events do not come from a standard library, how are they determined or how do, you, how do you find them? This is a great question and I assume also that this is in regards to the EU ADR system. Um, that is explicitly stated in their user guide. So you will, you will have access to a small table that shows you the various uh, three-letter codes that represent certain disease states. I can only assume that over time as more drug pair and event data get added to that system that the three-letter codes will increase over time as well. So I, I, I shouldn't have made it seem like it wasn't going to be um, mm -hmm. comprehensive. It is very comprehensive. It's just um, it is a different type of event coding than what we are used to in the safety world. We typically would code to ICD-9 or 10 or MEDRA. The next question, uh, we understand your focus today is on evaluate, evaluation rather than detection, but we are interested in what database and tools you might recommend for signal detection, i.e. for adverse reactions in marketed products. <clears throat> sure, so again, um, I think the EU ADR system is a wonderful tool to use for free that will uh, give you a, the capability of identifying potential signals uh, within a particular event to drug pair. Although, as we've already discussed, it's quite limited in its data right now. But that is an ongoing project and it will expand over time. Um, for now, the products that are available on the marketplace for these large scale uh, queries of database, uh, public or private databases, are really, um, one, the Empirica signal tool from Oracle, um, and that tool queries the WHO Vigi base and FDA AIRS data sets and displays to you potential scores for disproportionality ratios, which would indicate to you potential signals there. Um, there's also now a new product by Oracle called the Empirica Healthcare which looks at similar information but from these large, robust healthcare databases like GPRD and others. <clears throat> um, much again for the purpose of signal detection. Um, the next would be, uh, uh, the question is, please suggest vaccine ADRs database other than VAERS. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Unfortunately, the only vaccine database that I'm currently aware of and using actively is the VAERS database. Um, I will have to get back to you on alternatives, but I do have your name here and I can follow back up with you. Um, the next question is, what is the price to get access to GCH um, in order to evaluate, for example, a couple of variables or outcomes? Yes, so um, I don't have any pricing information for these four fee databases. You, you must contact the vendor uh, specifically, which in this case is, is GCH themselves. Uh, all of the contact information for these four fee are in the reference section. So you, you should be able to reach out directly to them. Um, the next question is, are the data sets that you could access via the CDC Wonder considered clean or raw? That's an excellent question. Um, they are not the raw. They are clean. They have been entered into the various databases, and they have been coded. Um, so that doesn't mean that the raw equivalent is not available in the data set. So for example, description of event as reported versus coded death. Those uh, could be available there. You, we would just have to look to see. But you should probably consider them uh, clean. <clears throat> and then I have a final question here. Have you ever encountered the situation where a new indication of a marketed medicinal product was granted based on the outcome of an epidemiologic study only? That is what I understood from your presentation, but it may not be true or very likely. Thanks. Yes, sorry if I gave that as a, as a um, I'm sorry if I made it seem like I had seen that. No, I have never seen that. Uh, drug approval has, in my experience, always come from randomized controlled designs. However, I, again, um, observational study designs aren't without merit. They can give credence to new indications of use, but that's more hypothesis generating than uh, hypothesis testing that would then feed into a, let's say, an NDA submission. Um, but I should preface that with, though my experience in pharma is, is I, I have a number of years in it. I'm not used, I've done two submissions in my entire career. So I'm hardly the expert with respect to all possible submissions that are out there in the world. Um, so please take that with a, a grain of salt. But yes, from my perspective, I've only seen uh, NDAs granted from randomized clinical trials. Somehow we have to get some time, so uh, thank you all. So um, we don't have any more questions at the moment. I do want to remind everybody that the presentation and recording will be sent today or tomorrow, so uh, please look out for that. And if, if for some reason you do not receive my email, you can always check on our website for the recording as well as other upcoming and past webinars. If you have any other questions after the webinar, feel free to contact us via phone or email. Uh, Rodney's information is on the slide right now. You can also email us at info at biofarm.com. We want to thank you very much for your participation and hope that the information Rodney provided was helpful. And we hope that you have a great rest of the day and evening. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.